I was up for this promotion and um, I thought it was a sh- I thought it was a shoe in for it. I didn't get the role and I went back to the president, the guy that I was reporting to at the time, who made the decision to hire someone else. And I said, Ted, you know, what could I have done differently? I, I just any feedback would be helpful. I'll never forget. Ted said, Kyle, when we were going through the hiring process for your for your now new boss, um, your division was not performing well and you never asked for help. I thought, well, no, I didn't ask for help because I, I needed to prove to you I could do this. I was able to fix this. What a shame. What an arrogant, egotistical reaction. And what a shame. Hey gang, I'm Nikila Croce, and today I'm sharing the mic with Kyle McDowell. Kyle's the author of Begin With We, 10 Principles for Building and Sustaining a Culture of Excellence, as well as a renowned speaker and leadership expert. Kyle's mission is to help transform apathy into optimism and fear into fulfillment while creating authentic leaders and high-performing teams. I love this mission. I wish that you had been present in many of my corporate uh, jobs and environments. So I'm thrilled to have you here, here, Kyle, to talk about you and what you're doing. Welcome to the show. Hey, Nikki. Thank you so much for that introduction. Great to be here. Um, and, And thank you for the kind words. Absolutely. So... I feel like a good place to start, and, and as I said to you before we were recording, I think sometimes it it's not necessarily the right direction to go to start with sort of, oh, you have a book, let's talk yeah. about it. But yeah. I do feel that the fact that your book is really about building an environment, for, forget sort of the corporate business side of it. Mm-hmm. It's about building an environment where people are able to feel safe to share their perspectives, to feel seen, to feel heard, and to be understood. And that's really at the core of this show. And so I wanted to start by asking you, um, because the just the sheer concept of beginning with we, while it is focused on a collective, I think has to, I imagine, originate from a lot of introspection on your end to be able to think through what is it that you understand and know either about yourself or your experience that could be a catalyst for that? Is that an accurate assumption? Um, not entirely. Um, believe okay, it. Okay, great. Yeah, Call yeah. me out on that. Uh, <laughs> b- believe it or not. Um, so the concept uh, for me began back in, I guess it was like 2017 or so. And I had just taken on a new, new role um, where the organization I was inheriting was about 14, 15,000 people. Um, big, big shop. Um, it was a $7 billion program that I ran. And when I took the role, uh, the, the gentleman that hired me shared that there was some cultural challenges. There were some issues um, that I was going to have to to address early. Well, I, I was game for that. But as I got kind of uh, indoctrinated into this new role, about 60 days into the role, You know, I learned a lot of things. Um, I learned that the leadership team that was, you know, my group of direct reports, they were, um, uh, they had tons of tenure. There were nearly a dozen years average tenure. They had seen people in my position come and go. The the gentleman before me, I believe was fired. I think the woman before him might've been fired as well or left on, 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 you know, not good terms. Um, uh, I knew that I had to do something different and it occurred to me if I were to approach this group of leaders, which I, I did about 90 days into my tenure, I scheduled a meeting for the top 40 or 50 leaders in the organization to come to, to come together. It was in Lawrence, Kansas, of all places. And, and that was going to be my chance to, to kind of show them who I was. But I realized the night before that if I were to step on stage and talk about how what Kyle was going to do, um, how I was here to change anything or save anything or transform anything, how I was there to do anything, it occurred to me this group was too smart for that. They'd seen that before. They, they, it wouldn't resonate. Um, but I did say, um, I went through a list of expectations, which turned out to be the 10 we's. It, but my expectations were not solely of them to me. It was how they should expect me to behave. I was very clear mm-hmm. about that. So um, I'd love to say there was some muse on my shoulder when I created these 10 principles um, that are now the 10 we's, which are the foundation of the book, begin with we. I wish there was some muse and some kind of sexy story about how this came about, but um, I just, it just, it, it, I was touched the night before in a way that, um, that just told me from some place somewhere that if you want different results, dude, you're going to have to lead differently. And I did. I love that you say that though, because I actually, um, 
I'll challenge you on that a little bit that it isn't, you know, sort of this um, compelling origin because I do feel a lot of times those moments where something, you know, whether I guess the universe, I, I'm thinking of my mother from the other side, sort of like giving you that smack on the back of the head, like, hey, are you going to like, what are you going to do about it kind of thing? Right. It's like you knew going into that situation, something told you because you could have walked in, you could have walked in and said all of those yeah. things. And you recognized that you were walking into a situation that, where there was effectively shaky ground. Um, there was probably a sense of distrust to some extent sure. if there's a lot of turnover. Sure. And so I do think that there is something to be said for the fact that just even that sheer moment of recognition and deciding I'm going to pivot this way is a pretty important moment in actually uncovering, you know, the rest of that, um, really building out those principles. So true. But I can't I can't go any further with you until I acknowledge your mother on the other side uh, coming through shaking. Cause I, I, I love that feeling. I know that feeling. And you struck a chord with me when you said that, um, if we're both lucky, they're shoulder to shoulder watching this and that's, they're really going to yeah, right. Oh, I just got goosebumps. How yeah. cool is that? Right. Um, so anyway, um, but I, I, I think that scenario, what you, the way you just framed that is not unlike many stops in our journey, whether it's mm -hmm. professional, personal, or otherwise, um, while that, that night, um, w when I developed the principles, then of course the next day when I went on stage to share them with the team, turned out to be one of the most important nights of my entire life. I didn't realize it then. Oh, wow. um, because it led me down a journey with this team at this organization where I, I've made lifelong friends. I haven't worked there, Nikki, in uh, almost five years. And I still have one-on-ones um, every four or six weeks with a few of the leaders with whom I was lucky to 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 partner with, which is really unusual, right? In big corporate America, when you're four or five years out from a company, you don't, you don't, you don't have a lot of interaction with the people that you worked with previously, at least in my journey, I have not until, until recently. It's a lot of intention behind that. Yeah, you're so true. And it takes, it takes both sides, obviously. And, and I just happened to be connected with some really good people that, um, that were, I guess, tolerant in some ways of my approach to leadership, which is wildly different than many, um, unfortunately, but, um, but was certainly different than what they had seen. The, the, the business results that we delivered were, were um, really, really transformational, but that's not the story here. The story is the connections that we made. And I'll tell you, if you were to ask the question, the first question a little bit differently, like from a different perspective to say, Kyle, if it wasn't when you came up with these principles, when was it? Here's when I would tell you that that there was this real intentional moment. Um, so I was out of corporate America for about a year and um, I had a non-compete. So I couldn't go back into the industry that I had left. Um, and uh, I said, okay, I'm going to write this book. So I, I, I took a year and a half to write this book. And about 10 months into the writing process, I had to start coming up with a name. And I reached out to people that I cared about and people that cared about me, especially those that I worked with because I, they knew me in a way that some of my friends and family may not. Mm -hmm. And there was one conversation I'll never forget with a woman named Julia, who um, was a direct report of mine, who I'm still in touch with, who I think the world of, we're, we're great friends. Um, I said, hey, Julia, I'm thinking about naming the book Begin With We. What do you think? And she said, that's the name. I said, well, well, say more. She goes, that's what you did with us. When you came into the organization, you didn't come in to say, I was going to do this or you were going to do that. Everything was about we. That's what you did. With, that's how you started this whole thing, Kyle. You began with we. Mm. That was a conversation that I'll never forget because that's that for me was the moment was like, okay, my legacy and my impact as it relates to this we stuff um, is really, really important to me. And it was so obvious in that conversation. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I like that you um, reframed it that way. I think that's a great way of putting it, especially because it is something where I, I emphasize a lot on the show, the value and the importance of introspection. The other side of that is, you know, what on what is on the other side of introspection is connection. Because in order to formulate those really important relationships in our lives, whether they're personal or professional or both, is this ability to know yourself well enough to understand what you're able to, you know, bring to the table, what other people can bring to the table that you can receive and to be really able to integrate your lives with other, your life with other people. And what I love that you just said that really um, hones in on something that I'm so 
enthusiastic about helping people with is building strong, sustainable support systems because there is no doing it alone. You can look at the most, I guess, you know, sort of categorically successful people, though I would argue that I think success should be measured differently than money and status. Amen. It, but you look at these people and it's like, even those people who are at the top, who have all the things, they didn't get there by themselves. There would be no way for them to get there entirely by themselves. So who are the people that you're surrounding yourself with that play a role and help elevate you throughout the process? Because even just going through my own career, I mean, I graduated in 2008 when the economy had tanked yeah. with a film degree. I was like, what's my life? Um, and then, you know, it was this one person giving me a chance and then this other person giving me a chance and then forming relationships with people who are then like, hey, I'm going over here. Do you want to join me over there? And so I think there's a lot of really valuable growth that can happen when we give ourselves the opportunity to not just, you know, kind of light the fire within a group when we're, we're in a certain circumstance, but to, as you've pointed out, really cultivate and maintain those relationships over time when they feel right. Yeah. Yeah. It, wow. Uh, beautifully summarized. <laughs> and, and I would add to that, it, it makes, it makes it kind of a shame that, um, there's a need for my book and that there's a need for, for career coaching and executive coach because, and, 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 and if you, the reason why that's a shame is when you do make that connection with, um, business outcomes coming secondary to, uh, creating bonds and trusting relationships with those that you work every day. Uh, if you, if you, if you prioritize it in, in the exact opposite order, like I'm going to focus on the people, I'm going to focus on my connection. I'm going to focus on how authentic I can be to help people be better than they were yesterday. Those business results come, but for whatever reason, um, and, and we can get into it or not. Um, there are too many to probably even discuss at one setting, people who uh, kind of matriculate or graduate into a position of leadership or they promote into it or whatever the right the scenario is, they lose sight of the value of those connections and, mm -hmm. and the importance of those connections. And they become a box checker or someone that's trying to catch someone doing something versus inspiring and motivating someone to be better than they were yesterday. It's a shame. And I can say that with confidence because the first 20 plus years of my career, Nikki, I didn't think like that. It was about results and only results. Um, okay. So I want to ask shame. you something about that. Please. Thank you for that honesty. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I also just want to dip in and really quickly say nice use of the word matriculate. I don't feel like it's used nearly often. <laughs> I'm like, right on. ding, now it's there. Yeah. It's, in the, it, yeah. it, 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 it's in the rotation for sure. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking as I was listening to you on another podcast was you made a comment of being open to feedback yeah. and wondering, have you always been, you know, um, good at receiving feedback and taking personal accountability? And if not, like, when did you start really recognizing that you wanted to lean uh, more into that? I think I've always been really good about personal accountability. I would, I would separate that from, uh, my ability to seek and probably separate that from my ability to learn from and, and embrace feedback. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I feel like when faced with feedback, I'm accountable. But what mm -hmm. I, I don't think what I was good at um, throughout the bulk of my career, certainly the first probably half, if not two thirds, was being open to feedback. I didn't seek it. I didn't. Um, I didn't. And when I got it, I think I would probably more often than not lean towards, they just don't get me or, you know, mm -hmm. they don't understand or they're, you know, it's them. It's not me. It's not me at all. But there was a moment uh, that, um, uh, later in my career, probably year 25, uh, I was up for this promotion and, um, I thought it was a, I thought it was a shoe in for it. I didn't get the role. And I went back to the president, the guy that I was reporting to at the time who made the decision to hire someone else. And I said, Ted, you know, what could I have done differently? I, I just, any feedback would be helpful. And at the time, I should have mentioned this a moment ago, at the time, the business unit I was running was underperforming. A lot of good reasons why. We had a correct, we had a get well plan that it wasn't a long-term concern, but it wasn't great. You know, things were not great. And he's, and, and I'll never forget, Ted said, Kyle, when we were going through the hiring process for your, for your now new boss, 
um, your division was not performing well and you never asked for help. You never raised your hand. You never asked for help. And I thought to myself at the time, I thought, well, no, I didn't ask for help because I, I needed to prove to you I could do this. I needed to prove to you that I was the man. I was able to fix this. What a shame. What an arrogant, egotistical reaction. And what a shame. Well, potentially a shame in the moment, but also what a great opportunity to look back on it now and have the ability to reflect on that and recognize that that was a really pivotal moment for you to recognize moving forward that you could change that. I didn't realize it at the moment, though. I mean, it took. No, no, I get that. I, yeah, trust okay. me, I get that. I'd be like, damn it. <laughs> but it wasn't even like a month later. It was probably years later in hindsight now. Yeah, but I bet. Yeah. And, and, and yes, I guess I should be proud that I recognized it for what it was. But if, if you're ever in one of those rapid fire question and answer type sessions and someone says, uh, best advice you ever gave or, uh, you were ever given, my, my response is almost always, don't be scared to ask for help. Um, mm. And this back to the heart of the original question you asked, you know, about, uh, you know, introspection and and no one does it alone. Um, obviously, one is required for the other. I think you must have that introspection to realize that you can't do it alone. But math says you can't do it alone. I mean, if, you, if yeah. you're doubtful, like math, like I always use this example. I'm a sports nerd, so uh, I'll go with it. The NFL, an NFL team has 53 men on the active roster and one head coach. If he could do it all, there wouldn't be assistant coaches. There wouldn't be offensive coordinators. There wouldn't be all these other coaches because one person cannot lead, inspire, motivate, coach, correct, critique 53 different people. It's not possible to do it alone. Um, so yeah, anyone who's ever, really like point. to your point, however we quantify or, or even qualify success, anyone that sits in that kind of Mount Rushmore of anything, they'll be the first to tell you it was not a, not a soul not a soul, not a solo journey, you know, for sure. And I, I appreciate the sports analogy because I think there are a lot of people who can relate to that. I mean, I grew up playing sports and I think about, you know, even just, I was a goalkeeper when I played soccer and it's like the oh goodness, yeah. coach that was better at actually providing guidance as a goalkeeper was very instrumental in making our team function the way that it needed to function. Right. Yeah. Um, now granted, I was also like a little bit sort of, um, I feel like I was like a black sheep soccer player where I was sort of like, I do this because I can, um, I'm not super passionate about it, but I could jump high and I would throw my body to the ground to save a, a goal. But it was, I also had that coach say to me, you're great because you're athletic. You'd be the best if you cared. And I think that stuck wow. with me in terms of, in terms of good advice. Yes. You know, it's weird that that's coming up right now, but I do actually think I mentioned this quite a lot in my life and it goes to show me the importance of having passion for what you're doing as well. Everything, everything. Yeah. You, and by the way, don't confuse patents. People can, can sometimes can, can confuse uh, or conflate rather passion with liking to do something. Like mm -hmm. I want to be my best version of the best version of myself, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Uh, and that's a passion of mine, but the things I have to do for that, to be the case. I don't like all of them. I don't enjoy yes. them. Right. But I, I care about it though. You must care. I love, Hey, what, what, um, how old were you during that soccer story when that coach said to you how you could be, if you cared, you remember probably 16 or 17. So not yesterday. Right. So it's been a while and you still <laughs> remember that yesterday. conversation, right? You remember that. How important was that? Right. That mm -hmm. it's funny. We've, we've, we've both bounced back and forth two or three different examples of things that people have said. And you mentioned this earlier and I didn't dig back or push back on it. You said, you know, someone along your journey, uh, said, you know, won't you come try this or you're pretty good at that. Mm -hmm. Right. And I yeah. bet, I bet you can put names with many of those somebodies if I were to, if we were to walk through those, right. That's true. Yeah. And how, so, and that's an opportunity that every one of us has. I just feel like because of my experience in, in, in kind of the path that I've taken throughout my journey on the planet, you know, mostly big corporate America, like connecting that obligation as a human to being a great leader is a really profound privilege that I think is, it's an obligation to, to do things like that. Tell someone that they can be better, do better, and you want to help them get there, get there. Yeah. Yeah. I really love that. And, you know, it's interesting too, because one of the things that, um, I, I really appreciate. So your 10 principles, I heard you share them um, on this other show and they really resonate a lot. I think that they're super important. I'm, 
I, I want you to share them if, um, if you're open to that, because I, I could easily dive into like, let's say one and then we'll talk about it and then that will go on and then we'll be here for 16 episodes. Yes. Yeah. So if you wouldn't mind kind of running through the principles and then I kind of want to make a broader question slash statement discussion around um, the idea of having these principles in general. Of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. You bet. Um, quick context and then I will. I'll fly through them because um, I'm going to in about 60 to 90 seconds do what I sometimes do on stage in 60 to 90 minutes. So, but, but I'll do it in a way that I think is, is helpful for your audience. So the principles are called the 10 we's. They are these sentences that I developed the night before I was meeting with these, this group of leaders that I mentioned earlier, and they became, um, they are, they are my identity in some ways. Um, but they're certainly my, my, um, my passion in another way. It's just funny. I use that word cause you went there a moment ago. Um, and, uh, I'm the first to admit they are not rocket science. As I begin, your audience is going to probably do some no shit, Kyle. Like, of course you want to be part of a team. And I introduced these principles um, to a team. And my 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 kind of overarching comment was these are the rules. And I used the word rules at the time because I didn't even call them principles at the time um, that govern a how we treat each other first, because I believe, Nikki, when we're behind the scenes and we're high functioning um, and we care about each other, the likelihood of us delivering externally, um, in, in very high uh, performance fashion, a fashion is, is exponentially greater. Um, so that, that was the premise, uh, under which they were introduced. And I completely agree with you Thank on that. You. I'll just say, because the best performing teams I've ever been on have been the group of people that honestly have such a diverse set of talents and personalities, but were brought together with like the same desire to create value yes. and understanding that, you know, we do all bring something different to the table. So I, I just really want to point out that that is a very aligned statement for what I've witnessed in my life, but yeah. also what I truly believe as well. Right on. That's, that's great to hear. And I think that's, that's what makes this so uh, in my mind, beautiful, but also simple. But um, the value is in living these principles and requiring those on your team to live them as well and calling them out, including the boss when he or she doesn't mm. live them. So Number one, and this is where the, yeah, no shit Kyle comes in. Uh, we do the right thing always. It's we, number one, we do the right thing. Uh, number two, and you, you'll see that these kind of piggyback off one another and they, they kind of pick up where the, the former left off. Number two is we lead by example. For me, the best way to do the right thing is to set an example. And that is an example that is worth replicating. Um, it is an example that if it were published in the company newsletter or online or all over the internet, whatever, uh, you would be proud for that example to be set. Um, um, it's the example that y your mother and my mother would be proud of, right? It, that's yes. exactly, that's what we're talking about. Because we, we we all set an example every day, all day. The question is, is it an example worth replicating? Um, mm. But if I'm going to lead by example, for me as a leader or a great team member, I think um, me making good on my commitments is the best thing I can do to set a great example. And that's we number three is we say what we're going to do and then we do it. It's that simple. Um, and we call each other out when we don't, because that's really important. You know, big corporate America, people make, people make these commitments and then they don't deliver. And then this domino of, of, of failure begins. So when we make a commitment, we're going to deliver. Now, when we, when we say we're going to do something, we actually, ha we have to actually do it. And that's we, number four, we take action. I think in a lot of environments, especially in big corporate America, people see something that needs to be addressed, but because it'll either end up just in creating more work for them. Um, or they might get reprimanded if it doesn't go well, they don't take that action. I just, I feel like there's this TSA thing in the back of my brain. Every time I talk about this one, it's like, if you see something, do something, we take action. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but if we want our teams and the people on our team to feel comfortable, to take risks, to, to try to be innovative, maybe be a little, um, provocative in our thinking, we need to recognize that mistakes will be made. So we, number five is we own our mistakes. Um, the only way members of the team are going to own their mistakes is if they know they're in an environment where they're going to get picked up. And that's we number six. We pick each other up. There's a caveat to we number six as a leader of people, not just a leader within the organization, because you don't have to have a bunch of direct reports to be a leader. But when you do have direct reports, there's an additional obligation for we number six. And that is you want to pick, we will pick our teammates up to new heights. It's, 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 it's not enough to just pick somebody up who's made a mistake or they stumbled. Uh, that's a requirement of the role. 
But if you really care about your team and you want them to be their best selves, whether it's on your team or somewhere else, you need to help them to their next job. Um, help them uh, uh, just to new heights, whether it's personally, professionally, whatever. Now, uh, the first six weeks that we've touched on are, um, they're hard to disagree with, right? Um, now we get a little bit more kind of confrontational or inflammatory, but really needed. So uh, we number seven, we measure ourselves by outcomes, not activity. Um, this is really important to me because, um, especially in big organizations, you know, there are a lot of interdependencies. I need, I need Nikki to help with this, but Nikki needs to go to accounting to get that. And there's this domino of things that needs to happen. Well, um, I'm, I'm glad Nikki scheduled a meeting with accounting, but if she didn't deliver the thing that she agreed to deliver as part of her commitment to me, when we made a commitment to one another, then that activity is for not. And, and mm -hmm. uh, this is most evidenced, I think, in, in many people's lives and their organizations with meeting overload. We have a meeting to talk about the meeting. Yeah. And then let's debrief on that meeting. Um, and then the meetings run long. And it's, it's just, I think we're over meeting in, in, in the corporate world. So I don't care about, about activity. I really don't. At the end of the day, consumers and our clients pay for outcomes. That's a really good point. I love that my Uber driver puts gasoline in the car before he or she picked me up. But I didn't pay for that. I paid for them to get me from A to B. That activity is yep. important, but it's not. It's not. It's not why I'm paying. Um, yeah. Okay. My favorite of all the we's is we number eight. So we challenge each other, and there's a follow-on one-word sentence, and it's diplomatically. And uh, mm. the rule for challenges is the challenge must be grounded in either data or experience. Can't be opinion. Uh, I, I feel we all have opinions and, and there's a cliche and a series of words that come behind that, that, um, is inappropriate for your audience. But if, if we want to be the best and we want to be proud of the work that we do and the legacy that we leave, um, it's important that we're in an environment where the boss can be challenged peer to peer challenges are the norm. Um, and then of course, from the team to the, to the leader, those, they must be part of our DNA. We just must challenge each other. Back to my sporting analogy earlier with the NFL. Should one man, that coach of 53 men, be the only one to allow, he's allowed to challenge those 53? Of course not. He can't be all places at all times. We need challenges from one another. Yeah. But challenge, uh, we number eight without we number nine is a recipe for anarchy or chaos. Uh, we eight is we challenge each other. We nine is we embrace challenge. So I know if Nikki, you come to me and you say, Kyle, hey, we challenge each other, right? It is my obligation to listen to you because since we're on the same team and you've subscribed to these principles, I know the challenge that's about to come is, is grounded in data or experience. You've thought about this and you're doing it. You're coming from a good place. We have to assume positive intention. Um, otherwise, it's just, it's just complaining. And once we've made it to we number nine, we're home free with we number 10. And that is we obsess over details. And I was purposeful to leave this one last because if we can get those first nine right, uh, the details are are what will separate us from our competition. They're what will make us great. We're gonna we're gonna mm -hmm. take just a second longer to QA our work. We're gonna take just a second longer to make sure that everyone's had their had their say in in this important rollout of whatever the product is, the marketing, whatever. Everyone has a chance to be obsessive over those details. I really believe our clients judge us and our customers judge us. Uh, and they, they equate our obsession over the details with how much we care about their experience and the product we deliver. You can't, you can't separate the two in my mind. That's the 10 weeks. Thank you so much. And you did that very beautifully in a very Thank short you. amount of time. <laughs> I, I fought every urge I had to comment on things. So that's also a testament to my ability to, <laughs> to grow through this podcast. Yes. Um, my ADHD is like questions, questions, questions. So <laughs> takes one to know one. <laughs> So I, I really appreciate that you start with do the right thing always. This is something that in my experience professionally in the tech sector, it, it, I've done work at startups that are less than 10 people and I've worked at Amazon. So like I've, and, and mid-sized businesses. So I've really run the gamut in my experience and where things start to fall apart is when the motivating factor is not the right doing yeah. the right thing. Yeah. It's doing the convenient thing, which sometimes might also be the right thing. Yeah. Like if there's overlap, by all means, do those things that way. But doing the convenient thing, doing the thing that's going to appease board members, doing the thing that's going to insert fill in the blank here. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that that 
comes down to just really sort of a core value thing. Mm -hmm. Also, there's an integrity to doing the mm -hmm. right thing mm -hmm. that needs to be established at the onset. So I feel like that makes total sense. And that I, I love the way that you've um, written these out also that there is a flow to them in terms of it's sort of a water. I say waterfall and then I'm immediately like, that's not the way you want to do tech work. Like <laughs> my agile brain is like, just so <laughs> like jigged in that direction. But so it, but it sort of waterfalls into, okay, this is the next principle. This is the next mm -hmm. principle. And it makes sense. There's a, a seamless flow to it. And, um, the other piece that really struck me too, was, you know, when we say we're going to do something, we do it. Oh man. Okay. So when I was working at Amazon, one of the things that, because I've, I've been at other companies since that they're like, well, Amazon does this, we should do it that way. And I'm like, I actually would explicitly say, because I've been there and I've witnessed how kind of defective this process can be that I, I wouldn't recommend that. I know that it's sort of touted as this big thing that you write these PRFAQs, that you explain what you're going to do by writing a, a, press release with a bunch of questions and answers to try to cultivate what the vision is and give people like your pitch. Sure, maybe that's great in theory, but when you've written 36 drafts so you can pander properly to leadership yeah, yeah, and preach. you're not delivering the actual product, yeah. it's like at what draft number do you feel that you actually understood what I was trying to yeah. convey? Yeah where we could have stopped and started delivering value. Yeah. And it's like, there is this sense of Amazon has, I think 14 leadership principles, if I'm correct. Um, and what would happen is people would sort of anchor on them in, in ways that I think are probably similar where like we challenge each other. Well, they have like have backbone, disagree and commit. And it's like, well, so you're telling me sort of in the same breath, like stand up for what you believe in. But if like somebody shuts you down, then just kind of shut up and, and do what mm. you're told to do. Mm. And so these principles would get weaponized instead of actually being used in a meaningful way. Yeah. I think there are certain times and certain principles that you could apply and say, sure, that makes sense. Mm. I feel, you know, like it, it works for the situation. But often what would happen is people would sort of leverage that as a way to justify maybe the poor decisions that they were making or okay. the lack of information that they had yeah. to make those decisions. And so what I think you do in the principles that you outline here is because of the way that they flow, there's an accountability mm -hmm. to the previous principle to That's then right. implement the next principle, right? Yep. And so there's a, a lot of intertwining these things in a way that creates a holistic approach where I feel a lot of companies sort of just slap things together. They're like, this sounds good. We can motivate people around yeah. these things, but they're not practiced in totality. Yeah. They're sort of practiced either one-off or again, like kind of weaponized right. to, to make a point instead of actually being productive. So hmm. um, that was the thing that came to mind as I was listening to you speak about these before. And the the other thing that I will say, because the PRFAQ was sort of also around like um, judging yourself by outcomes, not activity, because 36 drafts later, like we're clearly not yeah. using our time wisely. <laughs> but I love the embracing the challenge, because when you mentioned if you're going to challenge somebody, you need to have data or experience. The thing that was going on in my head was, OK, I agree with you that we absolutely, when possible, want to have data because that's a much more useful mm -hmm. way of conveying mm -hmm. um, potential impact, whether that's an experience is sort of the anecdotal data. Right. Um, and so I'm thinking, okay, is there a scenario in which I'm expressing my opinion and I, I feel like I want to challenge something, but all I have right now is sort of my, my gut instinct or a feeling that I have. So is that rooted in anecdote and experience that I have, or do I need to go look up something to then validate my opinion before I challenge you on it? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you're kind of asking people to go a layer deeper before just sort of spouting off, well, I don't like that, or I think it exactly. should be this way instead of that way. Exactly. You're holding people accountable to the principle by saying, please come with these things. It doesn't have to be, if you don't have the numbers because the numbers don't exist yet or they're mm -hmm. not relevant, mm -hmm. that's fine. Mm -hmm. But then justify why your opinion is what it is. Yeah. So at least we can have a meaningful discussion around that. Was that sort of the thought with that? 100%. And without knowing it, I think you, you, you validated it. You started your, you started the question talking about experiences at Amazon and how, 
um, there's this kind of reputation or this lore associated with it. And they say, well, this is how we do it at Amazon. And you said this at the beginning of your, uh, beginning of your question. Well, no, I actually work there. And I could tell you that that pro- that's experience. Yeah. Yeah. That is you, right? That is you saying, okay, I'm in this company now. And it's, and it's, a, it's the exact same example I use either on stage or in the book. It's like, if, 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 if we're in a team meeting and we're working towards, let's say a product launch, and someone on the team has launched a similar product at an, even at another organization or even knows of someone that launched a similar product and they have experience that says we're heading down the wrong path, they are obligated to share that. They're obligated. Mm. And we are obligated to listen because that's why we have the, the we of we embrace challenge. Like We must hear this person out. It's, it's ego otherwise. Well, yeah. And I like that you said that because you had mentioned something earlier um, probably many minutes ago now uh, around sort of like the way that leaders show up a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately, the reality, like you said, you know, having to even come up with this idea yeah. and bring it to a book yeah. and, and try to help coach people on this. But I do think that idea that it it's the people who lead from a place of self-serving rather than collective um, service that I feel in my experience struggle the most with that. There's a sense of, you know, embracing the challenge is, well, first of all, I think people who are very much egocentric are not going to embrace the challenge. They're going to shut down that right. <laughs> shit That's as right. soon as they can. That's right. Um, That's right. And, and, and because so, they can. And because well, yes. they can. That's right. a really great point. Yeah. That's a really great point because there is something to be said for the fact that a lot of organizations um, allow it, whether it's complacency, complicit, being complicit or what have you. Um, but, you know, when you keep promoting people who have this mentality, calling them leaders and trying to get people to rally around them, when you've got a team of unhappy people yeah. who are conveying to you that they are unhappy and that this isn't working. Yeah. Like to me, that's that's a systemic issue that needs to be addressed at a more, um, I almost said at a broader level, but in reality, it's like a more granular level, like inspect that and look at it and ask yourself why that's a problem. You you nailed something that I, that I, I spend a lot of time on, um, and and you called it systemic, which it absolutely is. And here's, here's how it happens. So I'm going to make this up team of 10 people inside a big corporate America, right? Uh, have a boss that nobody respects. They don't like working with him. Um, And, uh, they don't like his boss either. They don't like working with her. So he is a product of she, right? So she sets this temperature, sets the tone and he's living it, uh, making it play out in, 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 and for his team, the team, it doesn't, the team doesn't, it doesn't resonate with them. They're not excited about it, but guess what? He leaves to go work somewhere else. Now we have this group of 10, you know, a handful of those guys or gals are going to throw their hand up and say, I want that job. I want to get promoted. Right. It is, it is almost, um, inherent in our, in our, in, in our, in the way that we think and operate that if we know that she is the hiring manager and we know how the guy that we didn't like our boss, how he behaved, we are going to behave like that guy. We are going to take on the attributes and characteristics of him that we loathed. Why? Because we want to endear ourselves to her, the woman who is making the hiring decision. And so the systemic cycle repeats over and, well, and so, go ahead, please. Oh, go please. Ahead, no, no, please. You go. Well, and I was, it, it, the cycle will continue until someone says, and this is where I think I had a little bit of success and it was really out of my own. And it wasn't some, it was me, me saying enough. I'm not going to lead this way. I'm not going to lead the way that I've been led. I want to be the leader I never had. It was more out of necessity for for my own mental health and peace of mind in corporate America because I had I, I'm not you know I had great compensation, great title, led lots of people, you know by all accounts was successful, uh, whatever that means. Um, but I was totally apathetic to the whole thing. I was like I I hated what I was doing. I was tired of all the bullshit and bureaucracy. And I said enough. And I like to think me saying enough led to people in my org also saying enough. Yes. So when they uh, grow into a new to leadership position, they lead differently. But until someone does that, it ain't changing. It's systemic. You're spot on. Right, right? It's not changing. Yeah, I love that you went there. There's so much to unpack there. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. I've witnessed it firsthand. Um, I've 
kind of always been the person that's like, I'm not doing that. Like I won't be a yes person. I just, it's not in, it's not in me. And what I know to be true is that when I've been confronted with situations, um, the word that you used is exactly the word that I use, which is apathetic. Yeah. It's like, I almost have to completely check out so I don't become emotionally attached to yes. the stress of the situation yes. being so just off base with what resonates with me yes. from a core value level. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, I'm basically like, I'm mentally ready to leave this job. I'm yep. done. I don't care. Yep. And so it's like, once I wake up and that's the thing that's going through my head, I'm like, I'm miserable here. I hate it. Yep. Um, there's nothing that can be done to change it. To your point, I think, you know, you get the right people in and they start to kind of adjust things. But when you're at a company that is already really established, it's much harder. The benefit of being at Amazon with how many different areas of the business that they have there is that you can have a good experience based on your leader yes. and, and the people that they cultivate and strengthen around them. Yes. But then you have what people called empire builders. Yes. And that is basically like, well, you're just going to bring up all the yes people that came Gosh. along with you. And that for me, it's like even thinking about it, I'm like, Ick. So it cringy. just like it it rubs me the wrong yeah, way yeah. so much. And I think about how like there were moments where I was really considering trying to get a promotion. And then I got to this point where I was like, I don't think I'm okay with compromising enough to get that promotion. Mm -hmm. I would rather leave and make less money than feel bound to something that like fundamentally doesn't feel right yeah. to me. And much like you, like I had, I was very lucky and, and considering that I graduated with like absolutely no opportunity in front of me and fell into the tech space, it was like, that was a real shift in the momentum of my career getting to Amazon. Mm. Um, it gave me a lot more credibility, which I really appreciated, mm -hmm. you know, from a resume standpoint, but it also really challenged me with what am I willing to accept and where do I have to draw the line? And I think professionally, that can be a very, very difficult conversation to have with yourself because I've done it in relationships and that shit's hard too. Yeah. But yeah. like when it's professional and your livelihood is reliant on that, you know, I've absolutely stayed in jobs because I needed the money. Mm -hmm. I've of course moved jobs because I needed the money also. But like I've I've stayed in a job unhappy because I'm like, I just need to do it. I just need to get it done. It's fine. But when you have, like, when you're feeling like you're actually fighting yourself on it constantly, something hits differently. And I agree with you that you have to decide for yourself, like, am I going to, whether it's in, you're in that situation, you're going to step up and you're going to step into it. And you're going to try to make it something else if you can and, and create that influence. Absolutely do that. But if it feels wrong and you're just sitting there going like, I, there's nothing I can do to make it feel right, then there is also a really important aspect of honoring, honoring yourself through that as well. Yeah. Because I think so much of what I did in my corporate career was literally just a massive amount of self-abandonment to like get to the next step. And you see a lot of people yeah. who are unsatisfied with where they're going because they don't feel connected to what they're actually doing or to your point, the leaders who they're following there. Like, do I really, yeah. and I think you actually um, decided to use a different uh, choice phrase when you were on this podcast I was listening to because you're maybe not a leader, a boss. And that's the thing, right? right. Is not every boss is a leader. That is a very distinct, important <laughs> thing to, to note. And, and I had Amen. a lot of bosses, but I didn't have a lot of leaders. Yeah. And, you know, Nikki, therein lies the rub. Um, um, Eckhart Tolle, uh, who I'm a big fan of, um, uh, wrote the, a book called The Power of Now. And in that, he talks about when there are things that go wrong in your life. And it's certainly true in our in our business lives, our work lives. You can either try to change it, get a uh, try to change it, embrace it or get away from it. Mm. And, and when we find ourselves in that situation in corporate America, and I want to be very clear about this, um, apathy um, will lead to us coming to a fork in the road that says, I can either endure this and make a living at this place, or I got to get out of it. If For those that make the decision to endure it and just keep their head down and be that yes person, I have nothing but love for you. I, I get it. You got bills, 
we have obligations and, and for whatever, whatever your scenario is, if that is the decision that you've made to stay inside of an organization, maybe reporting to someone who does not respect what you do, doesn't bring the best out of you as a boss, not a leader, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I get it. Mm. And I did it for a lot of years. Um, but I will also tell you, um, on the other side of that scary leap to go do something different, and it might mean, like you say, Nikki, you might have to take a pay cut. You might have to take a step back in 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 your in your kind of your, your matriculation through corporate America. You may have to. Um, but on the other side of that, if you if you if you do if you plan it right and it comes together in a way that I've been lucky enough to have it come together, and and not, I'm not alone in that. Many have as well. You you seem to be in that same space as well. You found your your you found your path in what you're doing and. Mm-hmm. The fulfillment that comes from that so dwarfs the negative side of the garbage that you had to deal with when you were kind of just keeping your head down. But if you wonder why companies become stagnant or if you wonder why organizations get lapped or they have turnover problems or attracting uh, problems, attracting great candidates, it's because of the stuff we're talking about, right? This The workforce becomes apathetic because there's a handful of people that behave in ways that are not um, all that flattering. They don't inspire people. So- and you raise your hand once, they might listen to you. You raise it twice, they don't listen to you. Why would you continue to raise your hand? Put your head down, get your paycheck, and go home. I don't begrudge anyone for doing that. It's just a, it's a shame that that has it has to be that way in some organizations because the fulfillment and connections that come when the leaders actually act like they're on the team, not running the team, um, is is a really beautiful thing to be a part of. Yeah, and it's phenomenally different. Just the energy that's brought to a place where that <laughs> yeah. is the case. You you mentioned um, early on the connections that you've kept with people from the organizations that you've been part of. And there are two ways that I've formed strong connections with people that I've worked with. One of them is Misery Loves Company. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all bitching about the same things true. because we're miserable. It's true. And then there are the people who really believe that there is more than whether it's what you're doing there or, or just in your own potential. And one of my best friends, um, that I worked at career builder with, I have to credit her with being kind of like my first adult friend out of college, you know, like, cause you're like, Oh my God, I made a friend. It was, my first work friend. <laughs> we weren't in like a forced social situation. We decided this, this is true. Oh. Um, and she recently left her, um, tech career as well and is pursuing something that she's much more passionate about and helping bring more holistic wellness to people and companies and things like that. And it's because being on the inside, you see where there are gaps and you see where the pain points are. And so when, when you surround yourself with people who have maybe like at the time, like we bitched about it, we complained about it. We were upset that life was unfair for us at that moment, but we kept moving forward with the intention of not always being there. Yeah. And that really strengthened the bond that we have because it was far more than just professional, but I think especially because it gave us a sense of accountability um, to ourselves to also be sharing in the experiences that we were having to propel us out of these circumstances that we didn't want to stay in. And so it's sort of like, you've got, somebody, I mean, it's, it's the whole idea of like pick each other up. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's like, we're not working at the same place, but we both have a desire to leave these situations that don't feel right to us. So how can I help you? Yeah. What can you do to help me knowing that you can ask for help, as you said at the beginning of all of it. And it's mm-hmm. like, so even though I can look at a lot of my work experience and kind of be like, Ooh, that wasn't great. There are bits and pieces that come out of it and relationships that are just so strong and consistent throughout those experiences cool. that I think in a lot of ways transform us. Um, but we don't necessarily see how significant it is mm-hmm. until you're in a situation where sort of all of the, like kind of the, the static clears yeah. and you're like, Oh, like it was a mess while I was in it. And I hated that, but we bonded over stuff. And then we had these deep conversations and, you know, when you were deciding that you were going to leave, I was also talking about what I was doing. And so you really start to, um, create more of that ecosystem that you want. And to the point, you know, you can actually find ways to collaborate with people doing the things that you care about. So that leap is terrifying. Like I'm with you a hundred percent. And it's like, are you going 
to just let it continue to be? Or yeah. are you going to like, you know, kind of brace for impact and then get through it? Yeah. And I think there's a time where you're going to realize that you're, you'd rather be uncomfortable, even if it's more seemingly more discomfort mm -hmm. for a brief amount of mm -hmm. time, than just continue to wake up every day feeling like you hate your life. Be miserable. Right. Right. Imagine this though. Imagine a world where, uh, what, what was the role? What was your, if you're comfortable sharing, what was the job you had when you two bonded? Like, what were you guys doing at the time? Um, so I was a product manager and she was an engagement manager. So sort of, she was dealing with the customer side of the product that I was building. Okay. And what, it, you know, what were the top two or three things that you really disliked about that job? <laughs> the bureaucracy. There were a lot of decisions being made that were seemingly on a whim. Okay. Um, and so we were very upfront with where the customers were using the product okay. and aware of what they were doing and just weren't really being listened to. Okay. And, um, I'd say the other thing was that it didn't feel like we had a voice, even mm. though we had the knowledge that we needed to make meaningful changes that would have actually helped propel the company forward more. Got it. Okay. Um, and I assume you took that role knowing, regardless of how good or bad or how much you loved it or hated that job, you took that job knowing that it wasn't the be all end all. It was a stepping stone to something else. You might not even know what it was, but you knew it was a, it was a step, right? It was part of your path. I mean, even literally, even literally when I took the job, it was different than what I, it ended up actually being because of yeah. how new the position was. I thought I was getting hired for marketing and it was like, no, you're actually doing product. And I was like, okay, that's fine. I have money. Like <laughs> I just, and it wasn't a lot of money at the time, but I could pay my rent, you know? So it was, it was a means to an end. It was a means to, and you knew that, right? You knew Yeah. it, it was, it, it's like, and that's the difference. And I'm going somewhere with this. That's the difference between a job and a career, which mm -hmm. is I've had plenty of, one of my favorite jobs my whole life was when I was 17 years old selling shoes. I worked at like a Foot Locker. Um, I didn't love it at the time, but looking back, of course. But imagine a world, here's where I get a little bit, maybe unicorns and rainbows and people might not follow me, but imagine a world where you can go to your boss or leader, ideally a leader, in that scenario, and you can say, listen, this ain't the be all end all for me. I, I, I don't like this job. Um, I, I know that I'm, I have my eyes set on something else, either within this company or elsewhere. And imagine when the, the leader were to say, got it. I know you're not going to be here forever, but I want you to be the best you can be while you're here. I want you to fucking crush this job. I want you to be really good at it. Why? Because I know it will better prepare you for the next role. Also, mm. also, and, and just as important, because I have needs too. We're in this relationship. I have needs too. I need our team to deliver X, Y, and Z and be really excellent. I need this team to be great because it's a reflection of how I lead. It's, it is my job performance criteria, right? So I want you to be your best knowing that you may not even be here a year from now. As a matter of fact, if you're here a year from now and you have your eyes on something else, I will help you get that job. But let's, let's have a handshake agreement now that knowing that this isn't going to last forever, and that's okay, because I'm not going to be in this job forever either. Right. Well, that's an interesting point too, because a lot of leaders or bosses act like, you know, they're, they're there for the long haul. And then like two weeks later, they're gone. And you're, you're like, wait a second, what just happened, well. right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, spirit, the spirit of this, of this fairy tale is I think if we're open, like I, I get pushed back sometimes because I get on these high horses about, you know, having an impact and, and being fulfilled. And, and I had a, a follower once reach out, um, or it was in the comments, say something like I serve, I, I flip burgers. Where's the fulfillment in that? Great, great question. Great point. To me, the answer is the leader of that shift crew of that team needs to make sure that those people on the team uh, are at their absolute best in the role that they're in, not because uh, it's a requirement of the job, but because it will better position them for their next role, which will better position them for their next role. Let's stop pretending that you're going to be here for 30 years. I know you're not going to be here for 30 years, but while you're here, you will be better off if you perform well, because the next job will become more obvious to you. You'll be more, you'll be more marketable, whatever. I perform well because our team is performing well. I just think like, you know, we, we don't recognize that, you know, someone who is earning just above minimum wage, um, like just because that's not going to be their career, which it shouldn't be, they still have value to add. And as their boss or as their leader, you should want that value to be part of their goal every single day for their benefit. And oh, by the way, you benefit because the team performs well. I just think yes. if we were to approach those conversations 
at all levels of leadership, um, we, we would all be better off for it. And we'd stop lying to ourselves and hiding, you know, how many, nobody's a company man or company woman anymore, right? We are as, we are as open to new opportunities as, as we've ever been. Right. So let's not, that let's is not, facts. right. Let's not, let's not like create this fairy tale expectation that, you know, warden June Cleaver in the sixties, when everybody worked at the same place for 30 and 40, it doesn't happen anymore. So while you're there, the goal should be to get the most, like I tell people, I have a small business that I'm a part of here uh, in Tampa. And I tell people on that team, if you're not here for years and you want to go do something else, you have a side hustle, you want to grow. I will help you with that. But in return, I need you to give your best while you're here and everybody wins. So let's just be open about it. Yeah. Well, I love that you, you made the comment about people not being like a company person anymore because it's like, don't act like you're not on LinkedIn saying yes. If a recruiter Facts. asks if you want to have a chat, Facts. because it would be, it would be honestly, probably a disadvantage to not say yes at the very least to have the conversation. Like I, I really the only times that I wouldn't entertain a recruiter conversation when I was still in tech was if I genuinely felt like I was in an okay place where I wasn't trying to actively leave the company that I was at. And it was just sort of like, you know, probably honestly, when I had just started, if I'm being <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I didn't, I didn't have a reason to leave yet. Um, but I think that, you know, it was always interesting to me to just kind of see what other people were thinking or how other people maybe sure. saw my skill set sure. because it is an eye opening thing to hear you talk about this person making the comment about flipping burgers and really thinking about, wow, yeah, you know, I've worked in service jobs before and I feel like, or like customer facing service jobs. And I feel like it was really punch the clock, get me out of here. Of like, I don't really need to feel motivated. I'm just doing that. And it's because all of the people around you sort of operate that way That's as right. well. And where does that come and so from? So you feed off of that. It, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and one, at least one person has the opportunity to set the temperature for that team. Yeah. Right. It, look, because let's, uh, this, this is going to maybe a little crass and I hopefully I don't offend, but it's probable that the, the, the shift leader is also not in it for the next 20 years. Like they right. are looking for their next step. So we all benefit if we all kill it in the role that we're in now, we can all move up and out. So yeah. it's, um, I, that openness is so sorely missing, but, it, but you know, there's a lack of authenticity in a lot of organizations. And so, so why would you be that vulnerable to share that? Well, I think you just hit the nail on the head with that is that it is extremely vulnerable to be honest about where you're at. And it does make me think about, um, this job that I had at Amazon, it might have, I can't remember now, it might have been my first year, year and a half there. And I had a team that I really loved, um, a boss that I really liked at the time, but then in retrospect realized like he wasn't really maybe doing as much as I thought he was, mm. but he had a good energy that like helped kind of keep the team, yeah, you know, shielded okay. from some of the bullshit. Yep. And um, the moment that I kind of realized, okay, I thought you were a really great leader. Um, maybe in some ways he was. I had to keep coming back with the same, this is a problem, this is a problem, mm -hmm. this is a problem in the way that we're operating, the way that I'm feeling about things. Uh. And it was like, I'm going to leave. And it's like, but there's nothing really being done. And it's like, okay, so effectively, I feel like I'm being told I do or I don't have value in this situation if nothing's being done to change it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's like an internalization, whether or not that's really true or not. It, it's what somebody else does with the information. But right. it was this feeling of, okay, how much more energy can I put into caring and trying to motivate the people around me when I feel like nothing I'm doing is being heard yeah. or expanded on for me to grow? Yeah. Yeah. And so it was interesting because one of my best friends, Mel, who um, she and I have just such a, a close bond. She is somebody that I started working with really early on in my uh, role at Amazon. And she said, you know, I remember like the first meeting that we were in together and I didn't know you and you were just like so passionate. And I just felt so inspired by like, what you were saying. And then it's like, by the end of it, I was like, fuck this place. Like, fuck it. I want to go. And, and, and so it's like, that was the erosion yeah. of just constant either like yeah 
getting shot down, not seeing activity turn into outcomes, like yeah. all of that stuff. And yeah. so it's like, you can start with the best of intentions yeah. too. And I really wonder how many people who are in these leadership positions started with the right intention, the right motivation. And they're just like, I can't fucking do it anymore. Whatever. Yes. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. But why, and, but why did they come to that conclusion? Why would the leader come to that conclusion? Because of their leader. Yeah, right? totally. And it's systemic to your point earlier. It's systemic. And that's where like, I, I, um, I say this, um, um, we, I think every single person on the planet that enters the workforce enters the workforce with optimism, with passion. They want to make a difference. They want to have an impact. And over time, and I was, at least I'll speak for me over time, all of those beautiful, um, uh, are those adjectives I just listed? Yeah, I guess those are adjectives. <laughs> um, they we lose them over time for whatever reason. Um, some of it is just just comes with age. Like you realize maybe this the the silver linings around certain things are not quite what they really are. You know, you have this idyllic view of the corporate world, or you know, when I get this title, things will be this way. Um, but that optimism and the passion uh, they all they all fade, and that's when. And I was there and I was there very, very strongly. It cost me a marriage. It cost me uh, my health. I got really unhealthy for a while. And then that's when I had that moment I shared earlier. I was like, enough. Um, but it's so easy to see how this happens. It's so easy to see how it happens. And, but, it, yeah. you know, I'm here to tell you, it does not have to be that way. Now, that does not mean we spring out of bed every morning, you know, with unicorns and rainbows and this, you know, music playing. And that's not, that's, it's called work. It's not called fun, right? I mean, they're like everything else. We talked about this earlier. It comes at a price. You, you must put in the work, have the discipline to do these things that provide opportunities to make money, to go do something else, to take vacations, to take care of your friends and family, those types of things. But it just, it doesn't, the Sunday scaries don't have to be a thing. They don't have to be a thing, at least not every Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's very true. Yeah. Well, because I do, I do think that it's unrealistic to think that we don't have any, you know, stressors or conflict or right. whatever. And I and I think that what you um, touch on with the idea of challenging each other in the principles is that conflict is inevitable. Like that will arise. That's the reality of humanity. Yes. So how is it that you actually approach things with intentionality, with, um, as you said, being uh, diplomatic. So with diplomacy, like really not just looking at it and saying, oh, these are the 10 principles. And so this is what I need to do. It's like, how do you embody that? How do you actually show up and make sure that that's part of what is translating into the way you're working, the company culture, the, the output of what all of that is to ultimately generate, you know, revenue for the business mm -hmm. or a mm -hmm. following or whatever it is that people are seeking. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the, um, one of the things that you had said also in uh, something else I had watched was that you were flattered that you were challenged by somebody at one point who thought like you had plagiarized something yeah, like when, true. was this at the first company that you were speaking about? Yeah. Yeah. And he kind of like approached you and said, I didn't think that that was legit. <laughs> yep. Yep. True story. Um, so he was in the crowd, part of the group that was uh, that first 40 or 50 leaders that um, the first time I ever talked about the 10 we's and um he admitted that he um, he Googled the 10 Wees while I was speaking to see if I had stolen them. But it got worse, Nikki. We, um, it was either that night at dinner, and it could have, it could have been a week later or a day later, but um, true story. Just don't remember exactly how much longer it happened or later it happened. Um, we were at dinner, and his name is Nick. He knows I tell the story. Um, he asked for the PowerPoint that I used. He wanted the actual file. And I was like, sure, Nick, no problem send it to him. And he later admitted that he wanted the PowerPoint because he wanted to check the properties to see if I was the creator of the document or was it somebody else's name there? Yep. True story. Well, that's a commitment in and of itself. Yeah. I, respect, um, right? Respect. I, I respected that he was open enough to tell me. Yes, oh, for sure. I mean, the fact that he was open, open enough also indicates that he felt like he could approach you about it. Yes. And the fact that he felt like he needed to do that, I mean, I, I can totally get it because I, I think that there, what we've discussed is there is an element of distrust with, within businesses yeah. when you feel like there's either constant turnover or like inconsistency yeah. in the way that things are operating. Yeah. You don't feel heard. So it's really interesting to see how, you know, 
you're coming up with these 10 principles, you walk in, you're like, oh, I have this realization. Like I can't make it about I, I have to make it about we yeah. share this. This guy's like, no, I don't buy it. That's not, exactly that. Right. that's not, yeah. that's not real. And it's like, but then he turns around and says, you know what? Good on you. Thanks yeah. for doing that. Because, yeah. because I was, I was wrong. So it's kind of a really complimentary scenario, despite maybe what might've been seen initially as like a, really? Thanks well, for, yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. Great observation. I'll, I'll share two, two quick, uh, responses to that. Um, I guess the bow on that present of that story is Nick, uh, with Nick is I asked one person to write a page in my book. Um, and it was Nick. I've stayed in touch with this guy since 2017. We had a call. I spoke, we haven't worked together in five, several years. I spoke to him just maybe a week or two ago. And the story that he tells in my book are about a $10 million mistake that he made. So this was after, wow. this was a year, to, a year or two after the whole, I don't believe this is you. Give me the PowerPoint, Kyle. Um, and, and I think and I'm sharing this because the, I think the commentary of this relationship is he started so skeptical and he is in the chapter for we own our mistakes because Nick and his team made a $10 million mistake. Um, they came to me um, and owned the mistake and created a, he, he called me, the story goes, he called me that evening that they, they discovered the mistake, um, almost convinced that his employment was going to be, was going to be ending because it was a massive mistake. Um, and I honestly, Nikki, to this day, I don't remember the call, the phone call. And we joke about that. And he says, and it's in the book, he says um, that I uh, reassured him he was the right guy for the job. Um, let's not, let's make sure it doesn't happen again. Proved to me it doesn't happen again. Like they created these QA checks and so on. But I think it's a neat story because he started so skeptical. And by the way, when I left this company, I went to another organization. He followed me there. Uh, we had a leadership role there and he's still at that same company. But the other story I wanted to share, which you'll allow me, I think is really, really, uh, poetic. When I first rolled the principles out, there was one person in particular who was really, really obstinate and convinced that I was just full of shit. She, uh, challenged me at every corner. Um, she was a direct report of mine and nearly every ask I made of her as her boss, uh, was met with attitude delays, just obstinate. She was, she was a jerk. Um, but for whatever reason, I knew I had to tolerate that and embrace her challenges of me because when she was being a jerk to me, I could have done what 99 out of a hundred bosses would do, bang my fit on the, my fist on the desk. Damn it, Julia, get me this report or, you know, whatever. Cause like we said earlier, I can as the boss, I can, but mm -hmm. I knew if I, and, 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 and I'm not that smart, but at the time I realized if I didn't live my own principles, I was a hypocrite. The whole thing is a house of cards. I knew if I reacted to her challenging me the way that she was and the way that I wanted to react, because I'm human, um, we, would, we wouldn't be talking today because those principles would never have resonated the way that they did. Those principles are still on their perform annual performance reviews. They have the 10 we awards uh, two or three times a year. Um, they, they give out these Wii bracelets that I still wear nonstop. Um, it's, it's part of their cultural DNA now. And none of that would have happened if I would have just said, damn it, Julia, stop being a jerk the way I wanted to. I had to take my own medicine and embrace the challenge she gave me. She, by the way, is one of my closest work friends, um, to date. I think the world of her. I was going uh, to ask if that was the Julia you mentioned at the one. beginning of the conversation. Same one. Same one. <laughs> That's yeah, too funny. It, hey man, it's worth mentioning when I met her, uh, that she had a team of about 200 people that reported to her, maybe a little bit less. She has, uh, 15,000 people reporting to her now. Wow. And, 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 I don't even uh, know what to do with that. <laughs> well, and parenthetically, she had me back to give a speech at her company. It's been over a year now. And when she introduced me to the crowd, she was like, a lot of you guys don't know this, but me and this next speaker did not get along at all. Like we were water and oil, but we were both mature enough to see that we had, we could learn from each other and grow from each other. And we have, and I still learn and grow from her. And I think she does as well. It's my favorite story to tell because what started as a very skeptical Julia about some guy in some shiny shoes and a start shirt uh, uh, and her skepticism of me have turned into, a, I think, a lifelong friendship. It's really cool. Wow. 
Yeah. That's such an amazing way to cap the episode, I think, Kyle. I mean, I could definitely talk to you for many, many more hours. <laughs> um, but I really love that because it just touches so beautifully on the power of both introspection and connection because you had the self-awareness to acknowledge what you needed to do in that situation to honor yourself and the principles and the people you were working with and look at this amazing lifelong relationship yeah. that has come from oh, cool. that integrity and that honesty and that openness in that relationship. Like what an absolute gift. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I feel very fortunate. I feel fortunate for my relationship with Julia and I feel fortunate for having spent the last hour plus with you. Thank you so much, Kyle. This has been absolutely amazing. Um, so people can find more about you and the work that you're doing at kylemcdowellinc.com. Mm -hmm. Is there anywhere you'd like them to find or follow you elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, pretty much all social platforms, same handle, at Kyle McDowell Inc. Um, the book is Begin With We. It's available worldwide. Um, Amazon's probably the easiest place to get it. Um, and I'm probably not your normal guest where I just throw those social media handles out and just hope for a follow. Follows are great, but I want to interact. Um, so feel free if there are, if anything that you and I have talked about today uh, resonates or, or confuses, whatever the right reaction is for you, and I would love to hear from you. Um, and if there's anything I can do to help folks on their journey, I'm, I'm, I'm legitimately and genuinely open, open to those opportunities and we look forward to hearing from you. That's amazing. Well, gang, you absolutely should engage with Kyle because this has been a super fun conversation, very insightful and very meaningful. And that's all for this episode. We'll catch you on the flip side. Gang, thanks so much for joining me for this week's episode. I just appreciate your support and it means so much to me that you tune in week after week. The best thing that you can do to help spread the word about the podcast is if this episode resonated with you, go ahead and share it with somebody else wherever you listen to your podcasts, or you can go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel and share it from there. I also really appreciate it if you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts because that really helps give people a better understanding of what the show's about and what you appreciate about the conversations that we're having. And until then, I'll catch you on the flip side.